right, here we go. Our theme for March is perspective. It was chosen by our Fargo chapter and illustrated by Fred Gay Romeo. Every creative act is an attempt to share a unique perspective on some slice of the world. What you see and how you see it shapes your beliefs. So what's your point of view and how are you putting it into your work? What was the last piece of music, writing, illustration, or film that opened a new window on the world for you? One of the most impactful artistic innovations was linear perspective, widely credited to Filippo Brunelleschi in the early 14th century. This breakthrough enabled artists to create the illusion of 3D space on a flat canvas, paving the way for ornate art and architecture of the Renaissance. Today, it feels like we are at another precipice with AI-generated images and video. We don't know how this rapidly emerging artistic tech will shape our perspectives. The machine is already capable of evoking real emotions, but only we can understand those feelings. Because seeing someone else's point of view is uniquely human. Considering another perspective fosters empathy, and we all desperately need more empathy. So remember, looking at a problem from multiple angles generates more possible solutions. So change your perspective and you can change your world. And um, so that's, that's our theme for the month, and a huge, huge thank you to our volunteer team. Um, again, none of this this morning or this month would have been possible without our amazing volunteers. So thank you, thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you. And a special thanks to just a few people who have absolutely been my rock for this month. Um, Rachel, doing all of our social media, she's absolutely crushed it. Um, so thank you, Rachel. Um, Maddie, our photographer, I don't, Maddie's back here taking photos of all of you lovely people. Uh, David, our videographer, and Angelica, she brought all of this set design, everything. Um, so if you need Angelica for any events, anything like that, she did all this and she's absolutely amazing. And then we had um, some florals, I wrote it down so I don't ruin the name, Avio Design, some floral or, uh, donations, so thank you so much. Um, so yeah, so special thanks to certain people. Thanks. And if you want to volunteer your time and help me, <laughs> um, please reach out via email. Um, it can be a, as much of a commitment as you have or need or want. It can be, I want to be your ex person, or I can just come and help set up chairs and coffee in the morning. So if you have the bandwidth or interest in doing so, please, please reach out. Um, and so a massive thanks to our local partners, the Clara, obviously for this amazing space, and Diana, who's here, thank you for absolutely everything. The Clara is gonna be our space all year long, so expect to find your route, find your parking spot, your bike spot, your bus route, whatever it may be. Um, this is our venue, so thank you to the Clara. Appreciate y'all. And then some other amazing local partners. We have Old Soul for providing all of our amazing pastries, Seasons Coffee for keeping us caffeinated. Uh, Seasons Coffee is here in the Clara, so if you're in the area, they also have a really, really beautiful, funky cafe, so you can come study, work, say hi to Greg, the owner. Um, thank you so much to Seasons. Um, the Co-op, they've been an amazing sponsor. They provided our fruit, some florals, so thank you to the Co-op. And uh, the Better Business Bureau, they uh, provided 150 gift bags for us. They're all in the back, so if you did not have a chance to grab a gift bag, please, please do. Um, so thank you so much to all of our local sponsors. And another biggest sponsor, Adobe. Thank you, Adobe, appreciate you. Oh, and if you want to sponsor and give me free stuff, <laughs> please reach out. <laughs> all right. Did you know that the number one way that people learn about Creative Morning Sacramento is through friends? This month, we invite you to bring a friend, whether they've never heard of Creative Mornings, have been away for a long time, but are excited to get back, or a Creative Mornings regular, but just need a push from a friend to join this Friday. Get them to tag along. We can't wait to see you, your buds, pour some more coffee, and expand our circle of friends for all of our future events. So please, please bring your friends along. That's how we're gonna keep the work going. Creative Mornings is currently in 238 chapters, cities, and 69 countries worldwide. 27,000 morning people attend a Creative Mornings talk every month. Our events are and always will be free, and they are 100% volunteer. So every single person here this morning, whether it's been our donations, myself, our um, yeah, photographer, videographer, design, everything has been 100% volunteer. So. Um, that is what keeps all of this free, so thank you all. 
Um, if you're looking for more creative mornings joy in your life, uh, from watercolor technique to business solutions to DIY craft hangs, field trips are hosted by people like you for our global community. When hosts step up with an offering, we celebrate their generosity by spotlighting and promoting your field trip to our community and doing our best to fill the room. Um, you can see a list of our upcoming field trips um, or apply to host your own. All right, and now for our Creative Mornings Manifesto before we get kicked off. The Creative Mornings Manifesto sets the tone for our events and shines a light on our values here at Creative Mornings. So everyone is creative. A creative life requires bravery and action, honesty and hard work. We are here to support you, celebrate with you, and encourage you to make the things that you love. We believe in the power of community. We believe in giving a damn. We believe in face-to-face -face connections in learning from others, in jazz hands, virtual claps, and virtual snaps. We bring together people who are driven by passion and purpose, confident that they will inspire one another and inspire change in neighborhoods and cities around the world. Oh, I want know. <laughs> Everyone is welcome. All right, enough about me, let's get started. Okay, Faith sent me her intro and it has a lot of big words, so stick with me. <laughs> <laughs> Faith J. McKinney is a curator dedicated to amplifying the voices of historically marginalized artists, rooted in critical discourse and curatorial interventions. With a focus on challenging dominant narratives in visual culture, McKinney's practice interrogates the intersection of post-colonialism, feminist theory, and race studies. So please help me welcome Faith to the stage. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Creative Mornings. Okay, so I just want to, we, I'm not gonna talk about this, I just want you to see the photo. So shout out to Beth Bauer, True Love Photos. I have no glasses on in this photo. I cannot see without these glasses, y'all. So when we think about perspective, just if you ever see me out and at the club and I'm cute, I don't have my glasses, I can't see you, right? <laughs> So when we talk about perspective, I want you to think about the person sitting next to you, in front of you, behind you, and think about that, that lens, right? That perspective. Not all of us have, are wearing our glasses right now, right? Some of us are blind. So, um, so I say that to, uh-oh, there we go. Okay, so I want to talk about perspective. Um, this, think about your lens, right? Some of us are on the left, right? And right now, every sorry, right now everything looks gloomy and rainy, right? And then some of us are coming with a perspective and experience that everything is sunny, right? So I, I want us, as we have this conversation, to think about that perspective. Right now, I will tell you that I am on the left a bit, right? In the state of our local and our our national um, politics, our you know our the world. So, but I want you to think about that perspective. Some people are living on the right, right? So where are you at? And where are the people next to you or around you? People that you don't know, the people that you live next to, what are our, how are we entering into this space, into community with this perspective? Um, I won't go over all of the perspectives, but again, I want you to think about mine, yours, and theirs, right? And there's all of these different things, economic status, ability, education, and knowledge. So we all come in this room right now with a different perspective. This is my perspective. So as you learn more about me, right, if you follow me on social media, if, you, um, if we've ever talked, some of these things are how I show up in the world. The first one, black woman and queer, right, intersectionality, right? So there's this moment that, I mean, there's, I don't relate maybe to a black male, right, a straight black man also don't, maybe don't re relate to a, a black queer woman that has, is working within a disability, right? So there's all these intersections of perspective that I want us to consider. Um, the last one, independent curator, is my economic status, right? So um, I'm coming at a space where all of my work are project-based. So I don't have a full-time nine-to-five job. So that I say that to say my perspective is coming from someone that's a creative and that is working in spaces where I'm like, pay me please, right? Um, so I start here and I will give, I'll, this is a little pop quiz. So. My perspective, I grew up with all three of these works in my home, plus a lot of other work. My mom was a, um, a black art dealer. She specialized in original prints. So if you know the first one, don't shout it, but you may know that from popular culture. 
right? This is the funeral procession, and if you watch the Cosby show, that was in their living room. It was also in my living room. Uh, Clark Clark Boogie Woogie is a print that I had at home. It's also in the MoMA in New York. And Sugar Shack, also a pop quiz, if you know what show that's from, Good Times. Um, but I grew up with these works in my home as a child. So I, I knew about black artists, and to be honest, I, I knew black, black people were doing art. I didn't know if anybody else was, because I grew up with black artists, right? Books and prints and in the conversations, we always talked about black art, and I was really proud of it. So any art history majors, art, anybody wants art? So you guys know this, right? Marilyn Spokestad is our godmother of art, right? So these are books that I have, plus maybe like five more. These are, she's an art, his, art historian, and she makes a lot of the books that we read. So I go to college, undergrad, and I realize that my perspective wasn't showing up in these books, right? I didn't see, I mean, maybe when we talk about the margins, literally in these books, people of color are in the margins. Maybe the last page in modernity, right? You might see, um, you know, you might see this black artist, or, or there's, there's these moments that all of this work is from the white, straight male perspective. And so I have this moment in undergrad, like, wow, where are we at? My perspective is not shown in these, in these books, right? And my professors, I would have to educate them a lot. So there's this traumatic experience in undergraduate school where I'm like, man, these people, I grew up, remember, I, here I am, right? So I'm having to teach folks about those folks in this class. So think about perspective, right? Where a lot of us are navigating this world, the art world, in our personal spaces with folks that don't understand us, right? They don't understand, they don't see our perspective. So that's really important for me in the work that I do. So curatorial activism, this is my Bible. I, I recommend it and I guarantee it will change your life. So thinking about, oh gosh, I want, I want to be a curator, I want to be an art historian, but my story isn't told. What does that mean for me? I almost left the field, right? I was in corporate America and I was like, I'm not going back because I don't see myself in this work. So Mara Riley, who I will tell you is a white woman. So right, she's actually, she created this book for someone like me and thinking about how can we get people in the art world to think about gender, race, and sexuality to understand that these are persistent concerns that require action. I didn't just want to work in a museum and hang you know, European art. I want to make sure that the art from women, from non-binary folks, from queer people, from artists working with disabilities were, were featured in my shows, in my gallery shows, in my museum exhibitions, in my programming. That was really important to me. So I would absolutely recommend um, picking this book up. It's amazing. Even if you're not a curator, if you just want to learn more about the perspective of other folks that don't, don't have on the same glasses as you, right? So I am a curatorial activist. And what that means is I am dedicated, um, I'm sorry, one who has dedicated their curatorial endeavors almost exclusively to visual culture in, of, and from the margins. That is to artists who are non-white, non-European, as well as women, feminists, and queer identifying artists. And obviously, if you didn't know what a curator is, one who has the care and superintendence of something. And if you know me, if you follow me, I care a lot about artists, specifically artists from the margins, right? I really want to make sure their perspectives are shown. And they're in this, in this space, right, I'm on this, I have this platform, but also through social media, through my website, through my program, and it, it's very, very important that as a curator, those folks are um, brought to the front and they're visible. So back to art history. You may know what a canon is, right? A sanction or accepted group of body or body of related works. Linda Nochlin, who's an amazing um, art historian, in the West, greatness has been defined since ant antiquity as white Western privilege and above all male. Another, I love this because I show this from little kids like kindergarten through adults, right? And there's, almost everyone could pick five out of seven of these works out, right? They're almost, when you think about the canon, they are ingrained in our psyche. You may not know the artist, but you know the work, you've seen it. That's the canon. This is also very white, male, straight. You know, that, that's what our canon looks like. So I want to introduce the perspective of one, black artists working in America. So if you, if you look just briefly, I know you can't read the, um, the artist, you may not have ever seen any of this work. But this work is so, um, when we think about perspective, black people in America, right? And there's, a, there's a, a really long history and there's a perspective that we should be listening to. So these are these, these artists. Please, if you, um, afterwards, if you'd like to know more about these artists, I can give you the name. You probably cannot see it on this screen. Also, women artists. 
Um, these are all women artists working, really thinking about the body, right? And there's a perspective of women, and we know what that looks like to be a woman or non-binary folk, right? When, when our body, they're using their body to give a perspective of the work that they're doing. And then at the local level, we have um, women artists, some of them are right next to you, sitting next to you, and they are, um, they're, they are saying something very important, and I sometimes get worried that we're not listening to them. Again, perspective, right? And they live with us. And they're here in the building, and they, they're making amazing work. Shout out to Esther, Jamie, Jessica, Shona, Ren, Ramona, Omanibie, and Beth for doing this work and making sure that their perspective is shared with all of us that don't wear the same glasses as them, right? These are black and brown women in our community. OK, so question, how do artists, curators, and institutions shift the gaze? I think about gaze as perspective, right? How do you shift the gaze? How do you tell people, stop looking at the canon and look at these artists, right? Or look at these artists or these artists. Shifting the gaze in the context of art refers to altering the perspective or focus through which artworks, exhibitions, and cultural narratives are perceived. This shift can involve challenging dominant narratives, disrupting conventional modes of representation, and centering marginalized voices and perspectives. So this is a video I highly recommend to snap a photo. It's a TED Talk by artist Titus Kafar. If on the right, you'll see Franz Halls. If you know art history, you know Franz Halls, family group and a landscape. You can, I don't have a, I don't, this has a pointer, maybe. But this image right here is a young black boy. Who is he? That was always my question when I seen him. I was like, hey, who is he? He's really recessed. I mean, he's, he obviously was in the family photo, so who, who is he? Titus redid this photo and completely changed the gaze. So now we're focusing on that figure, right? And now he comes into focus. So that's so important when we think about the work that I'm doing is I'm really trying to white out everything else and say, hey, these are the people I want you to look at. So they have something to say. Um, this is my absolute favorite painting. Um, this is Olympia by Edward Monet. Um, I believe it's in the Louvre. Maybe if someone knows that, I don't know. Um, but I wrote so many papers on this on this work, and I found out you can't really see it, but there is a a black cat right here. There are more essays in art history on that black cat than there are the black woman. Like really, I mean that's that. I was shocked because I'm like, wait, who is this again? Who is this woman that takes up? It's a very large painting. She takes up half of the painting, right? And I love Olympia because of how she's looking. I just I'm fascinated by um, Olympia, who is this the the white woman figure. But no one was writing about this black woman. And here comes Denise Merrill, a curator, at the Wallach Art Gallery in Columbia University. And completely, she wrote a book called Posing Modernity. And now we know that this black woman's name is Lore. She was a model for a lot of these artists. And when you see black women in, in this time in paintings, it was probably her. But we don't know. Why don't we know anything about her, right? So there's this moment as curators, we have to shift the gaze. We know who Olympia is. I'm not even going to talk about her. We know her. We have so much information about this woman. We know exactly who she is. But we need to know more about Laura, right? Changing the perspective. And I would recommend also there's a great video on this exhibition um, that you can look at also. So the question of equality centers on the very nature of institutional structures themselves, on patriarchy, and on the white masculine prerogative that is assumed as natural. Natural in quotes, right? Ooh. Boom, boom, boom. OK. <laughs> I love the British Museum, right, as a curator. I went there, and I fell in love. I loved it. But there's this moment of perspective. And there's some looting that was going on, right? And there's so many perspectives and stories, but who's, say, who's telling those stories, right? How is it framed? And whose space is it in, right? It's in this very, I mean, the structure itself is, we, we yeah. The Brutish, Muse <laughs> the, the Brutish Museum is a great book I highly recommend, but there's um, a lot of problematic history, obviously, that's going in this place. Burm, burm, burm. Okay. <laughs> um, I used to work here, and I have this, I have this photo because I actually, I, you know, like many of us that grew up here, you go to Crocker in second grade, right? Fell in love with the place. Went home, and I don't remember this, but my mom said I came home like, hey, I didn't see any of the art that I have at home in that. My mom's like, yeah, that was like my first moment, right, in second grade. Like, oh, wow, they're not showing the art that we live with. Um, I use this photo because I worked here as a community engagement manager. 
and I invited the equivalent of um, a principal in after school program. Principal, he had staff under him and he had um, students under his staff. And I invited him into the museum to do a walkthrough and like, hey, bring your students, bring your staff back. He called me right where we're looking. He was standing right here and he called me and said, can you come outside? And I said, like, yeah, what's going on? And he said, am I okay in there? Am I dressed well? Will they perceive me well? I looked in the window, he didn't see himself. And I thought about that moment like, wow, first the structure, right? It's very, I mean, very white, right? Just, just in color, I mean, it's very white. But there's this moment that's not everyone feels comfortable in there. I do, I'll go in this place in sweats and a do-rag and a, you know, like there's, I feel comfortable, but not everyone feels comfortable in this space. I grew up in it, so I feel comfortable. I only say that to say like the perspective and who is in the spaces. And I think a lot of us have to question that sometimes. When you walk in space, like, hey, whose story is, whose story is being told? And in, in, in what, and how is it framed is really important. Okay, I'm gonna speed it up. Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> I show this because there's a conversation right now in our community where perspective and we need to highlight and we need to make sure that marginalized voices are heard, not silenced. And I put that, take it as you wish, drink the tea, please. <laughs> um, I'm gonna speed up. But white supremacy is embodied in these institutions that tokenize us, that invite us into their spaces where they absolutely have no interest in seeding power. So I would highly recommend following Change the Museum when you think about perspectives. And I share this because you'll go to the, and you'll be like, oh my God, these people are like really going through it in the museum. And I think what I wanna talk about perspective in this moment is just because it didn't happen to you doesn't mean it didn't happen to someone. So think about that and you'll hear stories like, wait, I love this museum. Someone that works there, someone that went there was harmed. What does that mean for you, right? It's not your perspective, but it is someone's pers perspective. So think about that. Please follow Change the Museum. We actually, unfortunately, our city just showed up on Change the Museum. Um, yeah, I digress a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I would be remiss if I didn't highlight the spaces that are centering voices, right? And I can show the last three, and we know what that looks like, but there's also some amazing spaces in our community that are also sharing the perspective of others. One is Soul Collective. From the photo, we know what it looks like, right? You already feel it. You know who's, vo you know who's in there, you know whose voice, who's showing up in the space. This is such a special space. Um, shout out to Estella and the team. They have done amazing work in Sacramento. These are the, and I wanna make sure I put this here, because I can talk about the ones that aren't doing it right. What about the ones that are doing it right? And they really need support. They need you to go to their shows, they need you to buy things and support the artists that are doing that work. Another Sojourner Truth African Heritage Museum. And this is where I grew up in the South. And so many people don't know. I talk to folks and they're like, oh yeah, oh I didn't know that was there. So I, this is a moment to highlight and go there from the perspective of black people living in not just your community, right, but in this country. And I'm gonna finish it off with just a few of my projects. So as a curator, how do I do this work? And this show happened in 2022, it was in Arden Fair Mall. If you're familiar with Arden Fair Mall, the old gap. So I grew up here, if you know the old gap. This was in the old gap. Um, after the pandemic, they, they, they were, it was empty, so they invited me in. They said, hey, can you put up a show? So Black Creativity at the Heart of Sacramento featured all works from black artists from age seven to 77, I think. Um, Jerry Simpson is in his, in his late 70s. But there's this moment that I wanted to make, to make sure the moms that are, dry, that are bringing their kids to the Arden Mall just to walk around. I didn't realize that was, that's a lifestyle, right? You just go to the mall just to walk around. As a kid, I did it, but I'm like, okay. But they got to come to, and a lot of people were like, hey, I've never come to a museum before. This was their moment to come to a museum, you know, and, and see the art, and, and that is, that's the work that I'm trying to do is change the perspective, bring it to them. Sometimes it can't be at the Crocker, right? Can't be at Burge, like you need to go to the community, and this is, this was that work, going to Arden Mall and, and organizing a show. Um, also changing the landscape. So this is at Twisted Track Gallery um, in 2022. 2022 was a busy year for me. But this was important because in our community, we love a landscape, right? Love a landscape. And I, um, there was this moment that I needed artists to share landscapes that were impacted by our existence. So all the work in the show, it's landscape. It's landscape work, but there is this moment of what are we doing to the landscape? How do we change the landscape? And the final is my baby here, um, coordinates ice pack. So 
It's situated across from Hook and Ladder. Right now, there's like a really big um, apartment building going up. But before that building um, went up, this building was here. And it was really important for me before it got demolished to bring 35 Sacramento artists in. Some of them are in this, in this space. Hey, Joa. Um, um, and I wanted to get their perspective. So they had a room, their own room, and we said, hey, this is your space. Like, what do you want to tell Sacramento? So 35 artists, and if you raise your hand if you went to coordinates, yay, that's great. Um, that, is, that was their perspective, right? You got to walk into this room and say, hey, what are our artists thinking about? And again, shout out to Joa. Joa changed this region with it. And if you know, you know, Joa here, his installation was amazing, right? And there was this moment that people got the perspective of a black man working in Sacramento. What is he thinking about? Sorry, Molly, I'm, I'm hurrying, I'm hurrying. Um, yeah, I could talk about this all day, every day, because, yeah, I love it. And that's it. How many times? I keep, keep looking at you. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have some? I'm going to open it for some questions. Anyone have a question? Okay. Can someone help me? I'm, I don't want to. Okay. Okay. Let's go here first. We'll work our way over. Thank you. So I just installed a show at City Hall on the fifth floor, right outside of the mayor's office. And I brought some artists in. Um, and it's not open to the public, which is a thing that I'm not necessarily happy about. But there is a moment that council members and the mayor get to walk by this work and see it and hear the stories um, of, that the artists are presenting. I also have a gallery on 16th Street that has been sitting um, because I have so many other projects that I'm trying to get through. Um, but I'm also secret, secret. Um, there will be another iteration of coordinates um, coming soon. Secret, secret, yeah, secret, secret. <laughs> hmm? Oh yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, Celebration Arts, I installed a show at Celebration Arts, uh, Black Girl Magic, thank you. Um, <laughs> so yes, I, have, I feel like I have shows all over the place, but yeah, yes, thank you. Next question. Yes, ma'am. Um, a lot of things in my question on some of the in your work are about location. And then how do you navigate when you're doing things and you won't recognize your own bias or do a lot of what about it? How do you mm. combat that and bring in your story and perspective in a lot? Are you following me on Instagram, girl? <laughs> 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 I mean, yes, 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 absolutely. And I think that's it, just being very vocal. I think by nature I'm a critic, so a lot of the spaces that I in here, I think that we should be really open to critical feedback and constructive criticism. So I try to, when I see it, I try to um, yell it very loud. And I think, yeah, most of you have heard it in this room probably, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, just speaking up, I think there's a lot, lot going on in our community right now, so if nothing else, sometimes it doesn't involve me, but I just need to be the voice and make sure people hear it. And that's what we're seeing now, is like someone just had to say, hey, look over here. Hope that answers. We'll talk though, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, I have a question about how Kelly voices um, from the presentation um, from the perspective. Because um, me as a Palestinian, um, I know what perspective means, but I know what it really means in the last six months. Mm -hmm. And I can see the most purple, mm -hmm. the most feminist, the most artist people that ban our voices. And mm -hmm. Thank you. Free Palestine. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys.
Bachelor Rob. Thank you, Faith, so much. Really appreciate you and your time.